Hey everyone and welcome back to the In Essence Movement. I'm your host Paresh Nama. I started this podcast so I can introduce you to the people that motivate and inspire me because I know that success leaves clues. And with those clues we can ask ourselves better questions and reflect so we can find our hidden potential and discover who we really are in essence. Today on the show I have a man who needs no introduction however it would be a miss if I don't go over a list of his accomplishments. With over two decades in the modeling world, Colin's career has taken him across the world, having cemented his supermodel status. But he didn't stop there. He's a TV actor with his roles in Xena and Reckless Behavior, and a movie star with Bollywood's Love Has No Language. He's an ambassador, having represented the New Zealand Asia Pacific Trust at the 2007 Miss World Competition in China, a two-time VIP ambassador for New Zealand's Fashion Week, and to, and a tourism ambassador to the United States, and the unofficial New Zealand ambassador to the world. But wait, there's more. A pageant judge many times over and a TV personality and presenter. New Zealand Next Top Model, New Zealand's Hottest Home Baker, Dance Masala, and guest judge on America's Next Top Model. And this is not to speak of his charitable work, which I hope to discuss today. He was named New Zealand's Sexiest Man in 2012 by Metro, an icon by Remax Magazine in 2017, and publicly voted as New Zealand's best dressed celebrity that same year. He's suave, he's sophisticated, he is Colin Mathura Jeffrey. <laughs> Colin. Wow. Thank you. What an intro. Some of it was incorrect. Incorrect. Yeah. What was incorrect? That's what happens when you get things off, you know, off, off, off you know, the, the internet yep. and that. So I was, um, not to be modest, <laughs> I was uh, seven or eight times ambassador of New Zealand Fashion Week. Oh, wow, okay. Like, like a lot of things are in expansion and um, they're reduced online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Wow. Well, firstly, thank you for being here. It's my, it's my honor. I mean, I think that, oh, and also, I've been in the industry since 1990, so that's 30, 30 years. Uh, 30 years wow. in the industry. And uh, I'm nearly 50 years old. So um, I think it's my honor to be here because I've always said that the stronger platform we all stand on, the stronger platform we will remain on mm -hmm. in terms of worth, in terms of protection, in terms of understanding. And so many people get it wrong. What they do is they try to jeopardize where we all stand and try to flick people off. I see it all the time and I, I don't like it. I don't like that um, behavior. Right. Okay, I want to I want to talk about that and that sort of thing, but I want to start off taking it all the way back. Um, I don't know when we talked about you coming on this podcast. I said to you that um, you're very comfortable in your skin, you're confident, um, and I want to know where that comes from. And I think the best place to start is if you tell me a little bit about, about your parents and uh, growing up, and because I believe that that's where yeah that's where it really begins. Absolutely, it's a it's a it's a bit of bitter happiness because I've lost both my parents. I lost my mum recently mm. and my dad um, at the end of the 90s. And it, you never you never recover from that kind of loss. But my parents cemented in me the strength to step forward to be, um, to be my own person. Actually, I said to someone yesterday that my mother always said, in adversity, when someone is treating you badly, step toward them, don't step away. Yeah. And that's very intimidating. I think that um, I think that comes from our Indian heritage, where um, not only are we uh, intellectually savvy, we actually are formidable um, as as a people, as a as a race, and um, and to never never be given or gifted the inadequacy inadequacies of another person to fit in with them. Mm. So in those sort of moments, step forward. And my mum always said, have fun. Like, always have fun. And my father always said to me, um, if like I would say to him, what does this mean or what does that mean? And he'd go, look it up. Or I'd go, I'm bored. And he'd go, <laughs> boredom is, is the attitude of the stupid people. So it's my responsibility and my fault. So I love that. Yeah. Um, you know, when you were annoyed and frustrated as a child, you realize that these gifts that your parents give you, which I now openly give to other people. Mm. Um, talk to me a little bit more about, you said uh, as, as an ethnic community or as being Indian, where um, 
we're, we've got that a little bit more. Where do you think that comes from and, and why? Is that your wife? No. <laughs> <laughs> She's checking in on him. Uh, well, obviously, um, India is, is, is like one of the great cradles of civilization. So much of our ancestral Indian heritage has influenced in modern day society so much. Mm -hmm. But um, unlike other people, particularly uh, Europeans, we don't bleat about it. We don't sort of wave our hands around and go, oh, well, we invented astrology. Yeah. We invented zero, yeah. you know, and things like that. And, um, and, and terminologies like a veranda, that's a Hindu word. That's a Hindu concept, the veranda that people step on. Yeah. People don't realize these yeah. things. So um, I've always known uh, about our cultural um, successes. And celebrated it, and and so um, you're probably going to go over this when when we reach it. So if you've got a question there, but when I started traveling, I I started to opt towards India. I started to realize and validate what a treasure it is to be ancestrally Indian. And mm -hmm. I think, and I'm, and I don't like cancel culture, and I don't believe in the fact that people. Uh, say that you, if you're of a particular race or of a particular thing, you can't share in in the um, the merits and the the credits of that cultural identity. I believe that in this modern age, we must share. So all of this grabby grabby thing that's going on now, where people aren't allowed to share cultural identity, is I think built on insecurity. And in order for mankind to progress, like we always have. Yeah. Uh, in harmony, we must share identity. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about growing up as half Indian, Anglo Indian. Um, Anglo Indian. That's Anglo -Indian. the terminology. Right. Um, in a in in a somewhat, I believe, racist New Zealand at that point. Would you agree? <laughs> you know, um, to, to shaking it up instantly. The, the, the truth of the matter is, coming in New Zealand, uh, being born in New Zealand, and being of um, an ethnic background, you realise, I realised how racist it was. Uh, there's just, um, it just, it just shocks me to my core, uh, how you don't understand what's going on when you come from a biracial family. Mm. My father was British, my mother Indian, and um, I just lived in this incredible um, home life. And then, and then to be um, relegated to one side or the other, or, or people saying to you really silly things like, must be horrible and you're like how can it be horrible yeah. it was incredible and uh yeah i just i just was very lucky to have had that um modern youthful exuberant household full of laughter and education and noise and dancing and food and and uh yeah so i i i just i just I'm so, so, so happy, but the racism came from both sides, uh, both sides of, of my family. Mm -hmm. um, the Indians were just as bad as the mm. Europeans and uh, it was sort of weird. And then when we had, but my parents were in love and when we had, when we came about my brother, who's a year older then I came and then my sister, we we're all a year apart. Um, they just loved us, so we were born of love, and we we never knew um, those sort of frustrations. But then, when I commercially became a model, yeah. all of this crap was thrown at me, like uh, modelling for brands in the early days. And people would say to me, "I'd turn up to a casting, and people would say, well, oh, there's a mistake. We can't have you. Your um, your people don't wear suits, or it would be a banking job. Oh no, your people don't. <laughs> you know." Um. Um, wouldn't front in a bank and i'm like what are my people yeah like who, who is this who who am i and um and i got very 
protective of the the Indian backdrop in New Zealand and commercially because I felt that they were being very dangerous with the cliches they were trying to put on me commercially and I wouldn't allow it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I did something really crazy. I said to my agent, raise my price, raise me out of the market. And she said, um, people won't look at you. And I said, well, they're not going to hire me anyway. Yeah. So let them not have the opportunity to have me. She went, great, <laughs> we'll do that. And then she, she did something. This is at Maisie Bestel Cohen, Sandra Bestel. She, she was my agent. Yeah. Then she started um, cultivating the star dim around me. So she, she would get me invited to events with uh so i could take my friends and we would go to a bar and there would be a thousand dollar bar tab so i was the sort of the creation of this icon um and i loved it <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure um do you ever feel like running away from the indian side of you never and sort of denying it oh never and, and the reason i ask is because um growing up in the western world i i've seen a lot of my friends personally do it um, I, I sort of just step away from no, it completely. It just, it just does my head in. Yeah. It is so embarrassing mm -hmm. when they do that. I agree. Um, and, you know, saying the word embarrassing, it has sing in it. <laughs> 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 it's, um, it is so, it breaks my heart. Yep. But that <clears throat> is cultural abuse. That's because they've been fed a narrative that they aren't good enough. Or they aren't this or they aren't that or... You know, uh, even when I was on television, I wasn't allowed to be um, by a, a certain magazine. They wouldn't, two things they did, which pissed me off. They wouldn't put me on the cover by myself because of my Indian backdrop. They told the publicity that um, when I was on Top Model and they wouldn't... Um, I wasn't allowed to be one of the hot presenters. I had to be some sort of parody. And then, after, and then I'd become friends with publicity and they shared that information with me. And then I think she saw the fury, that Indian look that we have, you know, when mm. the line has been crossed. And to this day, I look at that magazine, I won't even touch it. So, um, but they interviewed me a couple of times. Yeah. And I did end up on the cover twice mm. um, with other people. But I, I was very short and sharp with them. I never, you know, when you, you, I never cared. I never invested because a lot of the, the magazine work I do where we are represented in a commercial value everywhere, uh, such as look at this time and everything. It's so important. But you look at magazines, where are our Indian faces? So, and people struggle yeah. to have me on the cover. So I, I think I'm on about... I've been on about 30 covers um, and it's never been a, a loss for the clients mm. to have me on those covers. But certain magazines won't have me because they are inherently racist and I won't back away from that. I don't give a, I don't <laughs> give a damn. So you said when, while you're on Next Top Model, that's fairly recent. Right up to today, we will have those um, problems. You go and you go to the supermarket and you scan those magazines. Yeah. And you look at who's on there. So they'll have, they'll say, oh, look, no, we do have a, a, an ethnic colored person on the cover, but it's Kamala Harris, the deputy president mm. of the United States of America, because she is good enough. Yeah. You know, where are the New Zealanders? Yeah. Where are the New Zealanders of an ethnic backdrop? Because I've always tried to be, before my ethnic backdrop, I've always tried to be a New Zealander with the masala, you know, I'll, I'll turn up to an event with a turban, mm. um, in, in a, a beautiful Indian ensemble and, um, but, uh, people love that because it's so contemporary, but then you'll see the, the game people are playing and, um, but I won't, I won't back away because I have enough people contacting me saying, it's so great to see you like this. And this is where I sort of, gently remove people from my situation. I have in my career, excuse my French, I have a no assholes policy. Yep. So I look at people and I make a personal list 
And I go, I will not work with these people. They have agendas. They are dangerous. They are dangerous to my cultural identity. They won't look at me as a contemporary New Zealander. They will look at me as an Indian cliche. Ah, oh, you know, and I, I, I won't tolerate it. And neither should you. It's, um, it's not worth getting angry about. Don't get mad, get even. <laughs> Don't get mad, get even. Um, so throughout your 30 years in the, in the industry, have you, have you felt insecurities? And, have you, and how do you deal with, with those? Insecurities like what? Well, <laughs> not just inadequacy, not being enough, or even the way you look. Uh, I think from the industry that you come from, that's, that's well, an important thing, Well, I come from the beauty thing, industry right? where every job I get, I have to apply for. Yeah. Every single time you've seen me on television, on the cover of a magazine or anywhere, I have applied for you're the not, job. You're not handpicked or... With, no. Oh, occasionally. <laughs> now I am. Now they just go, oh, look, no, we want that. Yes. Yeah. The hottest curry in the land. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's about um, inadequacy. See... So my inadequacies and my insecurities are mine and my cross to bear. So it's things like when I was on Xena Warrior Princess, the script said horse riding prince, you know, who comes in on horseback. And then I said, I can't ride a horse. And all the agents said, don't say you can't ride a horse. Lie. Mm. I won't lie mm. because... So, uh, because it's just dangerous for everyone. I'm just not that stupid. Yeah. And then, um, so they had to train me to ride a horse, which I turned out to be a natural of. So ancestrally, um, probably equestrian background of, of my family in India, uh, because we are of that warrior caste, you know, so obviously they were on horseback mm. uh, a few hundred years back. Um, so then I, I don't I don't back away from that kind of stuff and then they paid me to learn. So so there are there are things there are there are things that you can be insecure about or things that you can realize you you're overstepping yourself but but I won't do that. I, I sort of play in the field I'm capable of. So I I'm I'm an older man as I said I'm nearly 50. I'm not I love being older. I I would never you know, throw myself back to want to be 20 again, want to be that skinny, gawky guy with pimples and, and everything. I just, I, I, I've grown into the man I want to be. So what I take from them is sort of you just embrace your insecurities and you, you face them? You have to because in your vulnerability is your strength. Mm -hmm. In your strength, um, you're actually weak. Because someone will always be better than you. Mm. Um, I want you to. I want you to go into that because I. I. I cannot agree more with you there. Um, I believe that comparison is is the death nail and you know the last nail in the coffin for your your uh, for your person. You just people that are so arrogant and say, "Oh, I'm so perfect," mm -hmm. and I'm. It's, it's embarrassing it because is. there was always going to be someone better than you. Yeah. I take my hat off to Olympians. I mean, you should have an Olympian on here because the, the thing about them is they are constantly playing in a field that they could lose in and then to recover from that. So I think, I think it's important to... I find my own strength as being more of the underdog and to know that I can push through and, and work through my own uh, personal demons, personal mm. agenda, and step forward to win. Yep. So then what does success look like for you? Success is uh, an individual um, story for each of us. So much of being, if we, if we were to look at our Indian backdrop, success is often uh, what our parents think mm -hmm. and what our parents can say about us. Yeah, absolutely. To, to other people. But for me, success has always been freedom. Freedom to do things, which is in this COVID world, uh, I, can't, I don't have that, those freedoms. So success was always to be able to sneak out of New Zealand. And I love museums. I have a bizarre fascination with dinosaurs and things like that. I, I should have been a scientist. <laughs> so I, I go to museums and I, I all over the world and I 
natural history museums and look at dinosaurs, yeah. skeletons and things like that. That's success where you had that freedom to do things, freedom to move. Um, and also to look back on your work with pride That's and, and joy. So I, I've created a wall like this of um, not only my work, because a client, I did a cover of iMagazine, a client sent me the cover uh, framed. Nice. Mounted beautifully. And then, um, so then I got my covers all done. God, it cost a fortune. It shocked <laughs> me. And then, um, and then I thought, you know what I need to do? I need to get my friends who have been on covers of magazines. So I stick with the covers and who have been on covers of magazines because of their successes and that. And I love it. It's so motivational. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually, I have them all. Yeah. I haven't put them up. And then I, con I constantly talk to my friends around the world and I say to them, please send me this one or that one or, or, or send me a high-res copy, but I prefer the magazine mm -hmm. to, to actually make a cover out of, to mount it professionally. Cool. Um, I want to talk about... Uh, I want to talk about your charitable charitable work, um, as I mentioned in the intro. Um, but before we get into that, I think it's important that because because I, I think um, I know a little bit about what you do behind the scenes. Um, I could be completely wrong, but in saying that, I want to go back a little bit. I want you to talk to me um, about your grandmother oh, on no. your on your father's side. Yeah, if you're okay with that, I I get very um, I get very emotional about it. So. I don't. It's hard. And, and yeah. the, the reason I say that is because I, I think this is not a side of people. This is not a side of you that people see, mm. um, and people don't know about. Um, but I think it's important to understand you as a person. Um, so understanding where but that you know, came from. If, if we were just to look at me as a person, mm -hmm. people. What I find when you're afforded a bit of fame, people aren't really interested in me as a person. They're interested in what they can take of me as a person defining themselves based on how they either like me or hate me. It's something I've come to terms with. Ex and, explain that. Uh, people, people work out who they are by um, whether they look at someone such as myself mm -hmm. and go, I think he's, a, he's arrogant or an asshole or, or, or an amazing person or fun or natural or, you know, they, they define themselves to their their peers based on how they view someone such as myself. And I, I'm just so disinterested in that. Um, uh, I, you know, you love it when someone loves you, but honestly, when you're famous, you, I mean, once every two days, I get someone write to me privately saying, you know, you should kill yourself. You know, it just, it's just, it's weird. It's weirdly nasty. And then you get, then you, you sort of ignore the fact that how people um, hunt you down to love you. You know, you've so inspired me. You've, yeah. you've, you've made me feel such joy and everything. But it's really interesting how, how people define themselves by f giving you a, a false narrative on how they perceive you, which is such a load of shit because only myself and my dearest friends and family know me. But getting back to, you know, um, look at me diverging. So getting <laughs> back, so getting back to um, my charitable uh, exploits. Mm -hmm. When you're afforded a bit of fame, which uh, New Zealand's ex top model Hodgson Baker and Dance Masala gifted me, you have all the charities who are so desperate for financial reward because there are so many vulnerable people all over the place. They all make a play for you. So I was working for breast cancer, child cancer, all these very um, uh, notable charities, you know, where there were uh, billboards and TV commercials and everything. And I really got tired of it. I just was like, enough, enough already. Um, because they were just, it was a bit exploitive. And, uh, and they, don't, they don't care how much they take from you. Mm -hmm. So then I, I thought to myself, what do I want to do? And my, my grandmother on my father's side, who I loved so much, um, she got dementia, she got Alzheimer's, and I grew through that, I lived through it. And it was such a tragic, tragic uh, experience to live through. And, um, and I, I said to a, a former agent, I said, where is 
um, Alzheimer's New Zealand, where is dementia? And I said, I want to work with them. So then they, they tracked them down and we had a meeting in Newmarket. And, um, and I told them my stories and I actually, I couldn't hold back the tears. And I, uh, cause it just brought me right back to square one. You know, when you're in an emotional, um, uh, release, it's, it's a terrible, it's a beautiful slash terrible thing because it brings you right back to square one. Anyone that's in, in, uh, mourning mm -hmm. and, uh, and it brought me right back to, to remembering my grandmother and what we all went through. So I, um, so I said, I want to work with this charity and, and it's not trendy to Alzheimer's New Zealand. It's not trendy. It's not fancy. And we, we went through our own, um, teething pains. But I've, I've shot commercials for them, done voiceovers, uh, opened up about it, done a national tour and walks for them. And, um, and I'm, I was the first champion for dementia. Uh, and, I, and I really love it because I just feel that dementia is a growing illness for all of us because we are growing older as a community. And, and also we need to um, care for each other. And when... We can't just take someone in our family who has Alzheimer's or dementia or mental illness and just lock them away. They have to be a part of our community and our communities, all of our communities, need to unify to understand how to handle someone. Because one thing about dementia patients is it's their mental faculties, Alzheimer's, it's their mental faculties that go and often their physical selves are very strong. Mm. So they can escape. Yep. And, uh, and I'm of the, the, the noise and the narrative that our, like, let's say school children and that discover someone who has dementia, instead of making fun of them or ignoring them to actually know how to rescue them. And through that, it's about, um, that's what I champion, that uh, we don't fear this illness, that we actually embrace what's happening, what's coming. And um, as scary as it is, um, support each other, you know, um, because that's, that's, it takes a community to protect a soul, you know, and that's, that's what I'm all for. Yeah. What was the, um, the biggest lesson you learned from your grandmother during that time? If you can think of anything, cause I, and know, I, I, just, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go, um, too far into this, but, I, um, I watched the video where you told a story about, I know that's, and you saw me, did I get emotional? I just, uh, uh, I would have, I get emotional. Yeah. Probably. And she was asking about the fruit and veg aisle yeah, yeah, and someone laughed yeah, at her yeah, and uh, I don't want to get into that, but what did you learn from? Oh, even just you saying that it just <laughs> Sorry. brings, it just, it just a, like a shock yeah. wave went through my body. Um, it just, what did I learn? Protection, love, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you, you did that on purpose. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, pr like protection. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's very sad. Because like you no, said, I'll, it's a, I'll, it's I'll a growing. Things. As a child, I learned how strong I could be. Because. Shit. <laughs> I learned how strong I could be because my grandmother needed to be respected and protected. And I didn't understand I didn't understand fully what was happening. It's just such a shock, you know, and um So what this does, as you can see, it brings me right back to that boy. And um, I'm not like I'm not ashamed of my tears because these are for her. Mm. Uh, but we need to we need to look after our families and and even strangers. 
I'd put myself out for anyone. It's the truth. How dare you Sorry. do this to me? <laughs> <laughs> Did this on purpose. Um, and the reason I, I, the reason I wanted you to talk about it is because. And like, again, like I said to you, that you are you are strong. You're mentally strong, which is very, uh, very I'm physically clear. Physically strong, and you're physically strong. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and but also, you're you're so comfortable. You know exactly what you want. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think know, and like, I think yeah, I think that's where it all began. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe. Um, I ju- I just my my family always said to me, whether it was my, my grandmother's love, all my grandparents loved us. And um, my parents, it, it was always just about reality, mm-hmm. reality, reality, reality. And, um, and again, it's, it's where my strength lies. So uh, I was always comfortable like, I don't like crying. I just, I don't even like going to movies where you cry. Um, but these tears are real, you know, they're, because they come from a place that is um, inside me that represents who I am and part of who, of, of someone who had, who meant the world to me. And, um, and so, yeah, it does, it does lend itself to my successes and everything. And, yeah. And, and that's where you sort of look at the, the game that people play in business and everything. And you just think I'm bigger and better than this because my grandma loved me. Absolutely. Um, you touched on receiving, you said what, almost daily or weekly, you get hate mail and people telling you to kill yourself and all of yeah, that. Yeah, horrible how, stuff. How do, you, how do you deal with that sort of negativity? Well, initially, you're kind of shocked by it. Mm-hmm. You're very shocked by it. It's awful. And there were a couple of times I bit back, and um, and then then again you're playing into their narrative because they're getting off on it. They're they're getting joy from that. And um, sometimes I sometimes I hunted them down, and um, and would walk into their jobs, and and. To stand in front of them and I'd say, did you want to talk to me? And honestly, you watch people just fall apart. Yeah. They just freak out. Um, I don't, and now, now I just think they're a joke, which is, you know, um, which is a truth that, you know, like uh, when you dislike someone to the level that someone who is appearing on television or on a commercial or on a billboard and you are writing them hate mail. When you read a newspaper uh, and you see that there are, there are murderers and rapists and people that, um, that create um, volatile human slavery and you're ignoring those people and attacking someone, then you've got a problem. So now I just rationalize that, I just, uh, you know, takes nothing to find someone so I went to a I went to a the Herald yep. they had a party uh, a year ago and they had a, uh, a there was a private detective there and she said I can find anyone <laughs> and that was funny <laughs> because uh, we, we were discussing this and she said you know we can, it's easy to find these people yeah and it is easy to find them they can't hide that much yeah so so just to wrap that up, dealing with negativity, you sort of just, would you empathize? Are you call it empathize for what they're going through or you sort no, of just rationalize? No, 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 no. Uh, you can't empathize for someone that's telling you to slit your wrists uh, because they're making, you're making them unhappy. Mm-hmm. Your happiness and your success is making someone unhappy. That, uh, don't empathize with those people at all. It's none of your business. Keep away from them. Um, and focus on the surroundings of people. You know, su- success begets success. Hang her- her- around successful people. Build a wall yep. of, um, not a wall around you, but a wall of successful people that they become the inspiration of you, your movement uh, forward in this world. W- or I always say walk towards the light. Don't let someone pull you into the shade. Oh, that's deep. 
I love that. I love that. Um, so then success and, and, and the main the main theme of this podcast, the success leaves clues. I've got Jim Rohn um, up on the road. Uh, on the wall I noticed this wall is amazing. And but where am I? Uh, we're going to get a photo of you. I'm going to get you to sign it. And I'll, then, get a, I'll give you a cover. Yeah, that'll if be Steve cool. Steve Jobs is on there. I'll give you a cover. <laughs> we'll put you right next to Steve Jobs then. Um, so yeah, success leaves clues, which, which you just mentioned as well. What do you think are the three top... Uh, what are the three, three top um, attributes of success, of a successful person? Um, the ability to never give up, mm -hmm. number one, never give up. Because failure is, is the seed of success, as crazy as that is. Um, it, throughout my career, where, where doors have closed and everything, other doors have opened. It takes, it just, it, it is the, the root of success yep. to, um, to fail. Uh, we'll plant that seed to what you want. And also, okay, number two, rationalize what you want. Um, what you want in a career, what you want in a destination, in business, because you've got to, um, you've got to know where you're going. You've got to know what you you get from it, what you gain from your situation. Right. You can't just be rolling through blind mm -hmm. to be exploited by everyone around you. And um, number three, uh, which I think is potentially the most important and feeds into the other two, is you've really got to love what you do. Because I have loved my job. And my job um, has a... Uh, a byproduct of fame. Yep. In today's age, people are obsessed with fame. That is the destination for them. For me, fame is a byproduct of me loving my job. Right. So 30 years in this industry, in an industry that is a beauty industry, where you are graded on how you look, how you present, how you are, I'm not afraid of that. People can love me, people can hate me, people can whatever, but I enjoy the job. I enjoy the creativity. I enjoy the people I play with mm -hmm. in the playground. And um, yeah, so I, I have so much fun with that. So they're my three things. Talk to me about uh, point number two, rationalizing your, your destination. How do you do that specifically? Is that from you know, goal setting? Or? No, it's, 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 it's a bit simpler than that. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes it uh, maybe a bit harder for some people to, to understand. When you walk into a dark room, in order to turn the light on, you can't go, oh, it needs light. There is a switch, flip the switch. So know that you've got to flip the switch, know your destination, know what you need to do, right. know how to, to work in that field. Yep. Um, and also to know that the, the destination in that dark room is to bring light to it. So know what you want. Mm -hmm. So you can't just sort of walk through and go, like even if you're working with someone or for someone else, know what you want. Do you want a house? Do you want a car? Do you want horses? Do you want holidays? Do you, you know, um, know, know, your, know your end game, which is never an end game. It's an end game for a moment <laughs> and then get a new end game. But, you know, like uh, you can write these lists and things like that, but you've really got to know what you want and how to activate it. Mm, you you piqued my interest there when you said your end game is not really your end game. Never an end game. Talk to me about that. Well, it's never like you you've always got to roll through and evolve and change. Um, one of the things I constantly say is the only constant in life is change. I'm going to show you. I've written this down because I've I've heard you say it so many times. The only constant is change. Talk to, uh, and ca sorry, carry on. Um, the only constant in life is yeah. change. You evolve, yep. you, you roll, mm -hmm. and, um, and you, never, you never are stagnant. Um, you breathe in, yep. you breathe out. Yeah. People, people uh, in this age are so confused by things. Like money is such a negative thing. Money is not negative. Money is a, 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 a transaction, like breathing. Breathe in, breathe out. Accept money, use money. You know, demand money. Mm -hmm. um, be fearless about it. People will just say yes or they'll say no. But if people destroy you for asking for what you deserve, then then you you're you're weaponized against them equally. Right. <laughs> um, failure. 
Yeah. What is your relationship with failure? How do you deal with failure? What does failure mean to well, you? F- failure is is embarrassing. Mm-hmm. You know, I've failed at a few things, and um, you know, you run away, you put your head in the sand, and you go, "Oh my god, I'm so embarrassed." I don't rip myself apart about it. I don't get depressed. I move on instantly. But I can sort of go, oh, that's embarrassing. But, you know, I don't know where this has come from at all. But I do sort of say to myself, one day I'll look back on this and it will not matter. And honestly, you just forget. I can't even... So so my rationale maybe is I mentally destroy the moments I've failed. So I don't... I'm not defined by them mm-hmm. necessarily. I'm defined by more by my successes. But failure is just a part of the pathway. I don't, I don't fear it at all. And as I've said before, you can plant a seed in failure and, um, and step forward and go. But, but I've, I've been in situations when you go, oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And all I remember is me saying, it doesn't matter. I don't really remember what Situation, I failed at. Right. Because then you're flipping the switch to failure. Have I failed? I've acknowledged it. I've worked it out. I've worked out why, when, mm-hmm. how all the questions fearlessly and then I've stepped forward again and gone, I can do this. I mean, in this world, there is nothing we can't do. The limitations are the limitations we put on ourselves. Correct. Is that something you were born with, do you think, or you've learned along the way? I, I, it has to be learned. And it has to be learned by surrounding yourself (laughs) with the right people. You know, I've got friends and family, my brother and sister, I will fall flat on my face. The first thing they'll do is laugh. The second thing they'll do is take a photo of me rolling around in the mud. And the third thing they'll do is pick me up and clean me up and say, it's okay, let's go, let's do this again. That's what you want. You want people to to, um, embrace you for who you are. Yeah. Um, so I've got a, I've got a, thank you for being here firstly. Um, I've got a last few questions that I want to ask. It's sort of a quick fire, not so much a quick fire, but, um, the way, fire, that's not a quick fire. the way this works, because it might take you a little while to, so some of these are a little bit hard. The way it works is I'll ask you five questions and the number of the number of the question is the amount of the number of answers that I want. So I'll ask you question number one. And I need one answer from you and so on and so forth. Correct. And three and four. Two answers. Two answers. Okay, go. And then. Let's give this a go. This sounds hard. So, uh, firstly, uh, question number one what is your greatest achievement? To always be happy. You're you're always happy? Mm. Yeah. I'm def. I am. I mean, I thought this was quick fire. So, the, (laughs) the, the definition of me is I'm. Like I'm, I'm not distraught. I'm not. I haven't fallen apart. I am happy. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, what more in life could you want? Yeah. That's that's. Cool. Uh, question number two is the best advice you've received, um, and I like to do it from mum and dad. Oh, okay. My father always said. He always pushed for me to. Um, to, to be self-learning, to, to actually know how to educate myself in situations. Um, and then my mother always said, in a negative situation, always step forward. Mm. Don't step back. Yeah. And mum and, and, um, always said, uh, look a million dollars, you'll make a million dollars. <laughs> Nice. Uh, question number three. I'm going to be a little bit cheeky with this one. So three, you talked about surrounding yourself with successful people. So three people that you've physically surrounded yourself with and then three um, people who you've sort of, you look to as inspiration that you may have not have met in person. Okay. Three successful people. Well, three people that you've surrounded yourself with. Okay, three that I've surrounded myself with. That, that have... Uh, contributed to your success oh okay well my brother he's he's always been um just very uh proud and you know like casually comfortably Mm -hmm. laughingly proud and i would be eating oysters and drinking champagne and and he'd just go you know um just loving loving 
the situation. So he was the first person when I got New Zealand's next top model, I turned around and I said to him, I, I, I've just been hired for New Zealand's next top model. And he said, you're going to be a New Zealand star from that. And I remember saying, now, really? And he goes, really? <laughs> <laughs> we had this laugh. And uh, my sister, she's, um, all, you know, again, like my brother, very supportive, um, very opinionated yep. about how I do things. And um, my, my best friend, Annie, Annie Baal, she's a former model turned... Um, uh, a businesswoman, and um, she's very like we have these very in depth conversations that are like therapy sessions where uh, a lot of information um, is is shared between both of us. Yeah. The, the definitions of of who we are and how we move. Yeah, it's great. So three and then three people I haven't met or you haven't or that you look up to that you you know haven't met. Or interacted with Chris. Uh, okay, well, there's so many people like I have interacted with that I that I still have. Okay, go. That, so I, that are a little more distant. Yeah. So give me those ones. Uh, I did a talk once, and the bridesmaid to my talk was um, a new politician, and um, and sh she went up first, and I remember turning around to her, and I went, oh, "You'll be great," and she went up, and she was so mind blowingly good, <laughs> and my jaw dropped. And then when she came down, I went to her, thanks a lot. <laughs> and then I walked up and I said, who wants to talk after her? Um, she's so good. Do you all have the feeling we've just been spoken to by the future Prime Minister of New Zealand? And that was just interrupted. Wow. Um, another person I have enormous respect for and influenced by is uh, a former Miss India, Madhu Sapri. She nearly won Miss Universe. She was so incredible when I modeled around the world and in India, she really had my back. And she taught me a lot about the internalness of business as a model, as a, as a business. And, um, and to this day, we're still really close. She lives in Italy now and, and we chat occasionally and I, um, I adore her. And as a third person, I've got this so many. I like I really draw in from all over all over the place. Like um, I work I work in the beauty industry, so my focus is often uh, successful people, such as the deceased designer Gianni Versace, who he he died. He was assassinated, unfortunately, um, and I got to model his brand. Um, after that, which was an incredible honor. And I opened the finale in a flaming runway. And, uh, but in modeling, your success is driven by whether you uh, appear on covers of magazines and do great campaigns and editorials and model for such brands as Versace. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, number four, four things that you're grateful for. I'm grateful for um, my life. I'm grateful for New Zealand. Uh, what a country. What a great... Um, you, you, it's just such a bragging backdrop. And, and today, when people are contacting you from all over the world, just going, you're so lucky to live there. You know, we take it for granted how great it is. So much so that silly people say things like, COVID isn't that big a deal. Well, it isn't that big a deal because we've worked hard to make it Correct. Yeah. wonderfully safe mm -hmm. when it's just running like a wildfire yeah. around the world and it's sitting on our borders. So we are out of the woods, but New Zealand is just spectacular, a country to be born in. Um, what else am I grateful for? Um, my genetics. Very lucky mum and dad. I, you know, totally emerged between... Uh, my parents, yeah. and um, and I'm also grateful for um, my tolerance of hot food. I love curry. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and lastly, five uh, the five top models of all time. Oh God. Okay, this will be my choice. So, mm -hmm. um, Yasmin Gowry, she was uh, she was Canadian. 
she was half German, half... Uh, her, her, her father was from um, pre, uh, pre-separated India. Um, so, um, and so now I think they say that she was half Pakistani because it's yep. separated into Pakistan. So, um, she was the most formidable nineties runway model. Um, she looked a lot like my mum right. actually back in the day. And, uh, Linda Evangelista, who was the, um, the chameleon who influenced a lot of how I would see and play the game of modeling, um, Madhu Sapri, who was an icon to me and, and an influence on my career. Um, I really, Annie Baal, who's one of my best friends, she was just such a beautiful model and really successful. Uh, she's part Maori and, um, and like many of us, we had to make our success external to New Zealand mm. because we were too ethnically diverse for... Um, New Zealand's sort of uh, pro-European insecurities. And um, who else? Uh, one more. Hmm? One more. One more. It's, there's so many. Uh, uh, God, let's think of a guy. Um, Milan Soman. Great Indian male model. Uh, nice guy as well. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been an honor uh, and a pleasure to be able to have this conversation with you. How dare you make me cry? <laughs> you set me up. You set me up. <laughs> Thank you.